Today on PGTV News, how nonprofits and for profit companies are working to help feed people during this pandemic. And while Polk County is slowly reopening, one local university is taking steps to protect potential students. That's all ahead on PGTV News. Welcome to PGTV News, I'm Stephen Barnes. And I'm Tina Mann. Before the coronavirus pandemic, food policy experts say roughly one out of every eight or nine Americans struggled to stay fed. Now, as many as one out of every four in the U.S. are projected to join the ranks of the hungry. However, nonprofits right here in Polk County are fighting against that hunger with mobile food pantries. The United Way of Central Florida's George W. Jenkins End Hunger Initiative and Feeding Tampa Bay have weekly mobile food pantry stops across Polk County. Visit feedingtampabay.org slash mobile dash pantries for the schedule as it is subject to change or cancellation due to rapidly changing circumstances. If you are in need of food, simply go to one of the locations and times listed on the Feeding Tampa Bay website to pick up prepackaged groceries free of charge. The nonprofit does not require ID, papers, or pre-screening to obtain food at a mobile pantry. And remember, Polk County Public Schools is still distributing breakfast and lunches to children 18 years and under while school campuses are closed. Children are no longer required to be present to receive meals, as was Polk County Schools' original policy. They do prefer that children are present to help ensure meals are distributed properly. If children are not present, you will need to bring the student's school ID or provide the student's name and school to staff. Parents or guardians can visit any meal distribution site for food, not just the school that the student attends. This service is available to all Polk County children, including students of public, private, and charter schools, as well as homeschool students. To see the list of meal distribution sites, visit polkschoolsfl.com slash lunch locations. It's good to see there's some options out there for families who are who trying are to feed their kids while they're at home. It's a scary time, so that's just one more way people are stepping up to help. Mm -hmm. Yep. Publix launched a new initiative to purchase fresh produce and milk to assist farmers impacted by the coronavirus pandemic. Publix will donate these products directly to Feeding America member food banks in its operating area. The initiative will support Florida produce farmers, southeastern dairy farmers, and the growing number of families looking to Feeding America for fresh fruits, vegetables, and milk during the coronavirus pandemic. Reports of farmers discarding produce and milk not sold to schools, restaurants, and hotel closures prompted the move. Publix hopes to address the needs of both the farming community and its local partner food banks through its initiative. According to the press release, since 2009, Publix has donated more than $2 billion in food to people in need and has pledged an additional $2 billion in food donations over the next 10 years. Public Supermarkets Charities recently made donations totaling $2 million to Feeding America food banks during the pandemic. The Publix Charities uh, food banks, uh, they've, they've been a strong supporter of community uh, programs like the, the homeless programs and things like that. I know even um, I used to work at the Florida Baptist Children's Homes and they provided uh, food for the kids that were at the homes and everything. So something like that, uh, you know, having a, a community partner like Publix here in Polk County is just phenomenal. Absolutely, and you know, George Jenkins would be proud of his company. Yes, yep. Like much of Polk County, Lakeland has reopened many areas to the public. City commissioners voted to reopen city pathways and trails, dog parks, the Cleveland Heights golf course, and tennis courts on May 1st. The city is taking a phased approach, as are many cities, counties, and the state of Florida. Restroom facilities, picnic pavilions, playgrounds, libraries, and more will remain closed until the success of Phase 1 can be determined. Lakeland Parks and Recreation has created a website that lists which public areas are open or still closed. You can find under the Parks Finder application at lakelandgov.net slash parksfinder. So we're starting to see a few things come back, a few things get back to normal a little bit. 
I am, am glad that the outdoor areas are being opened a little mm. more. I know that one of the biggest stresses and the biggest anxieties that I've felt personally in all of this is just I don't feel like I can get outside and get active and and of course exercise helps with all of the yeah. anxiety. Well and when you're used to a schedule of going to work and having a routine and then suddenly you have no routine at all by opening some of these parks and stuff up it allows people to get back into some type of routine if right. even if it's just going to the park for an hour of, of walking around and exercising. Exactly. Florida Polytechnic University has resumed campus tours for prospective students. The admissions department recently announced that it will host safe individual visits to the Lakeland campus. Tours were one of the campus's activities that were suspended in March due to the COVID-19 pandemic. The new personalized campus visits align with recommendations from the state officials and the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. These include a no touch, no contact environment and groups of no more than six people. Students from all Florida counties will be eligible to schedule a visit, except for those who reside in Palm Beach, Miami-Dade, and Broward counties. These restrictions will be eased upon guidance from Governor Ron DeSantis, whose Phase 1 state reopening plan includes allowing campus tours. For more information on scheduling a visit, go online to floridapoly.edu slash visit. No touchy. <laughs> Well, and you know, and, and that's the thing is, is a lot of the things that we thought we weren't going to be able to do, as long as we do them smartly and safely, right. like there's, there's only so much that you can do to actually prevent the spread of it. Right. The rest of it is really just kind of common sense, you know. Wash your hands. Wash lot. your hands, stay, stay a safe distance away from people. Dip them that's in big. some jalapeno juice so you don't touch your face. <laughs> I don't I heard know. That I, one. <laughs> that's a bad idea. That's a bad idea. Because high school seniors across the country aren't being able to experience traditional senior activities, a new tradition is popping up to try to help the transitioning students. Across the country, and now right here in Polk County, Adopt a Senior social media groups are bringing people together to adopt high school seniors. The idea is to pledge to send a letter, card, gift, gift card, snack, or other items to let the adopted senior know their community is thinking of them. Interested parents can join the group posting class or portfolio photos of their senior along with a short bio. Those who want to adopt the senior then comment on the post and send them a private message. Lana Cannon, the Auburndale local who started the Adopt a Senior class of 2020 for Polk County, Florida group, cautions parents to make sure to screen the person adopting and do not give out personal information if they aren't comfortable with them. Cannon advises that the safest way to avoid giving one's address to strangers is to create an Amazon wish list. Send the wish list to interested adopters and your address is private. You can find the Polk County Adopt a Senior group on Facebook. That's a pretty cool story. I yeah. mean, that's, I know there's a lot of, of seniors that are really disappointed around there. I'm glad they're going to get graduation, but they're missing out on proms and a lot of the parties mm -hmm. and trips that they would have otherwise. Yeah, I think, I think it's a neat way just to kind of let, let a kid know, like, hey, we're thinking of you. We know this is a tough time. We want you to know that we're proud of you and your accomplishments are not going unnoticed. An anonymous donor had given thousands of masks to the city of Lakeland's assisted living facilities. Uh, Greg Sanova, uh, attorney here in town, uh, has a client who also happens to be a friend of mine who, uh, who saw what was donated a couple of weeks ago when another uh, local company, Tampa Bay Fisheries, had made a large donation to PPE and said, hey, I can't donate on that scale, but I'd love to do something to help. And uh, knowing that the donations before had gone to first responders and medical providers, uh, this donor said, I would really love to see that uh, we get some gear into the hands of the part of our, our uh, community that's suffering the most. And as we know, that's, that's been our nursing homes and our assisted living facilities. So the donor requested to remain anonymous, but did ask that we do this in memory uh, of Ruth Rose Boddicker. Lakeland Commissioner Scott Franklin was recently contacted by a client who wanted to donate personal protective equipment to assisted living facilities. Working with the Florida Assisted Living Association, the donation of 6,000 pieces of PPE gear 
will go directly to Lakeland area assisted living facilities. These items are in high demand by those working in direct environments impacted by the coronavirus. And of course we know those folks living in the assisted living facilities are kind of our priority one here in Polk County. Um, and the highest risk. Yeah, they're, they're in the highest risk category and of course our, our folks who are working in those, in those places need to protect themselves so they're not bringing it in to, right. to others. Yep. A mattress company with a warehouse in Bartow is gearing up to use its mattress materials to produce 70,000 face masks per week. Of course, Takana, a national mattress manufacturer with a local shop in Bartow, began looking to supply hospital beds in mid-March amid the mushrooming COVID-19 pandemic, according to a company spokesperson. The company also considered whether to keep the fit factories open and opted to keep them open where it was safe. As the pandemic progressed, Corsicana made a package of 10 masks for each employee and their families, then started producing them nationwide for companies that reported a need for them. The company went online to see what was already being made to study mask design and then realized that in the making of their mattresses, they already had the materials available for production. Two different mask varieties were created, a 100% cotton white mask and black mask that used a polysynthetic material that was a little heavier. Many communities now have public mask requirements in place, he said, citing as one example Southern Texas, where Corsicana's main facility sits. Corsicana Mattress Company plans to offer the 70,000 masks a week at cost to businesses and directly to consumers through Corsicana's e-commerce retailers. That's pretty cool. They already had everything they needed to kind of switch gears. Story after story mm -hmm. about people stepping up, thinking outside the box and providing a need. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I know that was a big thing during this pandemic was, uh, you know, the ask for companies to switch what they're doing to provide materials and resources that are vital to, to kind of quelling this whole this whole pandemic. I'm glad people are stepping up. Mm -hmm. A Winter Haven couple will be featured on a new Fox game show series called Ultimate Tag, which airs later this month. Don Weiss and his wife Erica flew to California for the Ultimate Tag filming last year. Competitors vault, dodge, tumble, and dive their way through several different three-dimensional courses. Contestants are chased by resident taggers with incredible athletic skills with one simple goal, don't get caught. The series will be hosted by brothers JJ, TJ, and Derek Watt. Weiss said his wife has a producer friend in California who's familiar with the show and shared the idea with him. The couple decided to apply, producing an audition tape and a Skype interview. Both Don and Erica are 30 years old and share a three-year-old son. Don also has an 11-year-old son. He teaches at Jewett Academy in Winter Haven and played football at a junior college in New York before moving to Florida and playing defensive back for Warner University at Lake Wales. He graduated with a bachelor's degree in exercise and sport leadership. The show was set in a city playground where the couple performed hardcore freestyle gymnastics, competing against some of Hollywood's top professional stunt devils who are used to the kind of pressure of performing in front of cameras. Ultimate Tag premieres on May 20th on Fox. Sounds like some very active, healthy people. Not, yes. <laughs> not yeah. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I'm sure they had a great time. I think uh, the, the Watt brothers are some of the most beloved uh, football players in the NFL. Uh, just great personalities. I'm sure it'll be a terrific show. It reminds me of, I don't know if you remember back in the day, American Gladiators. Yes, yeah. I love them when they would just beat each other with Where the you, yeah. you as the average Joe have to take on these supreme athletes and we they would try gather to, as a family oh, and watch it. that all together. If it's it anything great. like American Gladiators, I'm in and good luck to the Weiss family. Thanks for watching PGTV News. The board review is coming up, but first a nonprofit is helping to save restaurants and feed healthcare workers across the country. Take a look at how Feed the Front Line is keeping doors open and people fed. Oh my, that is quite the donation.
This started amongst a group of friends and colleagues, the, the majority of us below the age of 24, 25, who came together and said, how can we use our skill set to, to make an impact? Uh, as young professionals, there wasn't necessarily an opportunity for us to contribute to finding a vaccine or to putting together ventilators, but we really pushed ourselves to find a way that we can make an impact and that anybody can make an impact. It's like a blessing from the sky, seriously. You know, it's just like, it came when we most needed it. And I mean, I, I'm i very thankful. They made us part of something important. We're trying to survive. We're trying to keep our doors open because it's not just us being affected as a business owners, it's families, families, a lot of families being affected. When business is good for us, families are, are doing well as well. It's just like one blessing after another. We're being blessed, they're being blessed, my staff's being blessed. It works out for everybody. We try to make sure all the right people are fed. Order sizes have frankly ranged from 20 people all the way up to 150. And we actually had one order on Easter where a hospital system came to us um, across the entire city of Houston and said, we want to feed all of our employees who are going to be working on Easter, lift their spirit, help them out. And in 24 hours, we delivered 2,500 meals to this entire hospital system, which was a truly incredible experience for us. We are doing some food for UT Southwestern. Got to feed the front line, right? Feed the front line, Texas. You guys work all day, so we're making sure they don't got to worry about eating. Receiving a meal from Feeding the Front Lines is a constant reminder of the support that we have from our Houston community. Showing that we're in this together and fighting together as a family. Thank, Thank you. you. When we have a community that has supported us like the Nashville community has, um, we just feel so blessed and thankful. And when we receive a meal from Feed the Front Lines, that just makes our day. Thank you. Hello, I'm Dr. Isaac Genai. I was part of a team that authored an article published on April 8, 2020, in CDC's Morbidity and Mortality Weekly Report, which reveals important new information about how COVID-19 can spread in a community. Large family gatherings can be a way to spread COVID-19 in communities, as illustrated in the cluster of cases detailed in this report. Patient A1.1, the initial patient in this investigation, was part of family cluster A. Patient A1.1 was the first case and represented the first transmission generation. In February 2020, a funeral was held for someone who died of non-COVID-19 causes. A close friend of the family, patient A1.1, shared a meal with members of the bereaved family, family B, the night before the funeral. Patient A1.1 had recently traveled out of state and had mild respiratory symptoms. Patient A1.1 had close contact with members of family B at the funeral. Three members of Family B developed COVID-19 symptoms in the days following the funeral. Patient B2.1 was hospitalized. Patient B3.1 developed symptoms days after embracing patient B2.1 while at the hospital while not wearing personal protective equipment or PPE. Ultimately, patient B2.1 died on day 28. Three days after the funeral, A1.1 attended a birthday party with nine other members of Family A, seven party attendees, then developed symptoms of COVID-19. Three were confirmed to have COVID-19 and four others were diagnosed with probable COVID-19. Patients A2.1 and A2.2 were hospitalized and ultimately died. One family member and a home care professional developed probable COVID-19 after providing personal care for A2.1 without using PPE. Patient A3.1 likely spread the disease to patient A4.1 a household contact who did not attend the birthday party. Three birthday party attendees with probable COVID-19 attended church six days after developing symptoms. Patient D3.1 developed COVID-19 following close contact with these patients at church. This cluster ultimately resulted in 16 cases and three deaths, 
and highlights how quickly the virus can spread in the community. Staying home and avoiding large gatherings are key to slowing the spread of COVID-19. Welcome to the Board Review with news about your county government. I'm your host, Tricia Pichette. Today you'll learn about county commission actions from the May 5, 2020 board meeting. As social distancing guidelines continue to prevent against the spread of COVID-19, commissioners kept their one-chair buffer at the dais Tuesday to carry out the business of the board. The board's meeting Tuesday combined both the morning regular session and public hearing sessions back-to-back. Polk County deputies and school guardians will receive specialized ballistic vests following the board approval to use about $220,000 from the Unclaimed Evidence Trust Fund. A two-year agreement extension was approved by the board for the operation of Ultimate Fitness Center, Inc. to operate the Polk County Fitness Center for Polk County's parks and natural resources. Lift station number 302 in the county's northeast region will be getting an upgrade following the approval of a work order amendment to an existing contract by the board Tuesday. Curry Controls Company was awarded a nearly $118,000 contract to provide supervisory control and data acquisition upgrades for this particular lift station. As part of the work, the remote communications will be improved, It will reduce the county's cost to maintain obsolete equipment and increase the pump station's pumping capacity by adding a third 350 horsepower pump. An interlocal agreement between Polk County and the City of Auburndale was approved for infrastructure improvements along Denton Avenue between Jones Road and Moss Road. As part of the work to be done, the county had urged the need for a more substantial pavement section to better handle heavy trucks and RVs. However, the quote for the work to the City of Auburndale exceeded the budget for the project and the $162,354 through the interlocal agreement will cover the difference in the budget and the quote for construction, which will add an additional two inches of asphalt and two inches of lime rock. The board approved an amendment with its agreement with the Kircher Group for a one-time expense of about $280,000 that will give specific assistance to the Roads and Drainage Division for the implementation of a software system upgrade. This will provide for the completion of specific tasks related to the new computerized maintenance management software and an analytical bridge maintenance software system. A three-year enterprise agreement with Microsoft will implement the Office 365 programs on all county employee computers. SharePoint Online and Project Online will also be included. The new software will cost about $586,194 annually. The board also held several public hearings on a variety of items. Those items up for consideration included a resolution to vacate a portion of platted sanitary sewer easement. This was continued until the board's June 2nd meeting. A small-scale comprehensive plan amendment and associated ordinance to change the future land use designation on a property in Lakeland from residential low 4X to Business Park Center was also continued until the board's second meeting in January 2021. The board transmitted a future land use designation change from residential low 1X to residential high X, which would allow for multifamily homes on 95 acres off Sand Mine Road in Davenport near the Osceola County line. The board also transmitted another property in the northeast area of the county for a future land use change from residential low 4X to residential medium X on about 14 acres in the transit supported development area and Ronald Reagan selected area plans. Well, that wraps up this edition of the board review. To keep current with programs and progress in the county, visit us online at polk-county.net or follow us on Facebook and Twitter. We encourage you to watch the next scheduled board meeting at 9 a.m. Tuesday, May 19, 2020. 
I'm Tisha Pichette. Thanks for watching.